All right, welcome to Blues's blog. Um, I have with me here, I reckon, one of the greatest harmonica players, living harmonica players around, and I'm so proud um, to call this man a friend, and also to be touring and listening to him play a number of times over the next couple of weeks. But um, yeah, welcome to the blog, Charlie. Glad to be here, Bruce, and good to see you. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm gonna try and ask some different questions, because you probably get asked a lot of the same questions, so I'm gonna, you know, give it a go. I'll oh, probably good. fall straight back into the same old questions. It's all good. <laughs> but um, away. yeah, so I was just wondering, um, blues for you, um, like what what does it mean, you know, for you? Like, or you know, like some people say, it's a um, you know a good man feeling bad and all that kind of stuff. Um, what That's would what you it say? Is. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's. Uh, I say it's it's your comforter when you're down and your buddy when you're up. Yeah. It's all purpose music. Uh, blues is about life. Wherever life can throw at you, you can express it in blues, you know. Yeah. My baby left me. Yeah. My baby came back. It was worse. <laughs> uh, just everything about life and uh, is blues has a spirit to it of Keep it on, keep it on. You know, we can do this. We can get through this. We can survive. Uh, I often talk about how in hillbilly music or country music, a guy would sing about my baby left me and I'm gonna go jump off the bridge. Yeah. But in blues, a guy would say, my baby left me, I'm gonna get me a new baby. You know? <laughs> That's what blues is like. You know, it's never given up. It a, has a spirit to it. It seems like it's more than just music. It really does have a a heart thing. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, cool. Um, so, I suppose obviously growing up, you had lots of um, music being played around the house, and that is that how kind of I remember for myself, um, Dad, who was actually tone deaf, <laughs> um, but he used to play jazz a lot, you know, on the radio always, and that kind of started switching me on to. To jazz and then to blues and that. So, you know, did you have that kind of thing? Well, my mom had a lot of records. She had classical records and she had swing music, you know, like Benny Goodman and yeah. uh, Benny, uh, Pops Armstrong, Louis Armstrong, and uh, all kinds of stuff like that, from classical to jazz, uh, and some pop stuff, you know. So there was blues on the radio, had WDIA, was a station. Rufus Thomas was uh, the, one of the DJs on WDIA. Every night when his show came on, he played Hootin' Blues by Sonny Terry. That was his theme song. Uh, then there was WLAC out of Nashville that played a lot of blues all night. And also XCRF from Ciudad Acuna, Coahuila, Mexico. Dr. Jasmo yeah. was on that station. And he played all kind of blues all night. So I could hear all that on the radio. And then uh, my mom played piano. I mean, she wasn't really a piano player, but she worked at it. It was yeah. like a little hobby of hers. Uh, there were street singers in Memphis that uh, fascinated me as a child. I mean, even like nine years old, I was like, wow. Yeah. Yeah, I played the guitar for tips on the corner. How cool is that? Yeah. Man. You know, I don't know who those guys were. I, later, I did get to meet one of them, a blind guy named Abe McNeil. He was a guitar player. Uh, and then I got to know a lot of the old timers around Memphis, like Will Shade, Gus Cannon, mm -hmm. Furry Lewis, Earl Bell, Red Roby, Willie B, Little Bit, uh, Son Smith. Uh, there was a harp player. I knew him as Harmonica Joe. Mm -hmm. That's what he called himself when I knew him, but his real name was Coy Love, and he made a few 45s for Son. And he played, his style of playing was something like uh, Sonny Terry's a little bit. Yeah. Oh, wow. uh, so there was a lot of musicians around, plus there was a lot of hillbilly musicians I knew too, and all those guys played blues. They all knew a, blue, a few blues tunes. Yeah. Uh, I remember one man was named Mr. Carmen, and he played guitar. He taught me a tune called Howie 61. Uh, and you know, I can't remember how he 
what it was I learned from him. Now, maybe I still play it, I can't remember. Mm -hmm. That was what he taught me. And he learned it from a guy named T. Mikey, a black guy that played guitar and saxophone. Uh, so I, it was in the, uh, the Burnett brothers lived across the street from me, Johnny and Dorsey Burnett. They were early uh, rockabilly guys. Mm -hmm. The train kept rolling was one of his hits. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, so it was just music all over Memphis, and I was just soaking it up, not yeah. knowing that that I was preparing myself for a career. I would have paid <laughs> a lot more attention. Yeah. <laughs> so um, in like say Memphis in those um, you know early days, um, you were Memphis Charlie. Was that was not that in Memphis? That was when I went to Chicago. Oh, was it? Okay, so oops. <laughs> they call me Memphis in Memphis. Oh right, okay, right. <laughs> so how did that come about? Like, did you did you make that name up or did not? I never just... made up anything. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when I got to Chicago, one of the first guys I met was Big Joe Williams, mm. and he's the guy that wrote "Baby Please Don't Go." Yeah. And played a nine-string guitar, mm. and he gave me the name Memphis Charlie. Wow. Okay. And we were rooming together in the basement of the Jazz Record Mart when it was at 7 West Grand at State Street in Chicago. Wow. So he gave me that name. Yeah, oh cool. And so you, I mean along the way, you've lived with so many blues legends. I mean like, blimey, it's just, it's amazing that there's like with, uh, well with Big Joe, um, or you lived with Mike Bloomfield for a while, I think, wasn't it? No, he, no? He, he and his wife lived in an apartment a block away from me. Uh -huh. And Mike would come over all the time and hang out when I was working in this other little record store in a part of town called Old Town. Mm -hmm. And the store was called the Old Wells Record Shop because it's on Wells Street. And uh, Homesick James would ride around the corner and he would come by a lot. Mm -hmm. And often it would be me and Homesick and Mike Bloomfield sitting around playing guitar, playing records, having a drink. Except Mike in those days didn't drink. Uh, so there was blues all over Chicago. Yeah, yeah. Wow. So in um, later years, Fenton Robinson and I were rooming with Luther Tucker. Yeah, and wow. So I mean, there were two killer guitar players right there. Oh yeah, yeah. We had a lot of fun. Uh, so over the years too, you've like played with, um, in your band, you've had many a blues legend in the guitar side of things, you know? Uh, so you've just, you know, you, I, I remember you hearing you say that you had like a book and you just ring up people whenever you wanted a new player and all that. And yeah, so you cool. could just call on kind of anyone you wanted to almost. Well, well the people I knew, I had yeah. a lot of numbers and yeah. I'd, you know, I'd be out playing and be other people on the bill or hanging out or sitting down or something. You. If you're making the rounds, you know, you're going to meet a lot of people. Yeah. I just would keep people's numbers. So If I liked the way they played. Yeah, yeah, exactly. They've got to, you know, make the grade. <laughs> or if they had a car, it made it go. <laughs> okay. Or if they owned the PA. <laughs> yeah. So, um, I love Christo Redemptor, uh, Redenta on, um, you'd had that on your first album, mm -hmm. um, which was written by a, a, another ja a jazz musician. How, how did you like pick that song to do? Like, was that just? Well, along with Chicago being loaded with the blues, it was also loaded with a lot of jazz. Mm -hmm. Especially when I lived in Old Town, there were all these clubs all up and down Well Street that had live jazz. Mm -hmm. uh, and I knew all the uh, door guys, you know, I could always get in for free and hear people like Jackie McLean and Joe DiOrio and Sonny Stitt and I don't remember all the people I used to hear, but I just soaked up a whole lot of jazz and at the Jazz Record Bar and the Old Wells uh, Record Shop, we there was a lot of jazz records that we played a lot of time. A lot of the customers wanted jazz, so I heard a lot of jazz and a lot of it really appealed to me because it was bluesy stuff like Jack McDuff and Grant Green and Jimmy Smith and. Freddie Roach and a lot of the guys like that. Charlie Mingus, even Thelonious Monk was really a blues player. Right? Yeah, yeah. And uh, so I got a, got a lot of ideas listening to jazz. And uh, when that album, A New Perspective by Donald Byrd came out, as soon as I heard Christopher Redenter, I was thinking, 
Yeah, I, I could play that on the harmonica. So uh, I started investigating playing that, and by coincidence, it came up where somebody wanted me to make an album, and I chose that tune to yeah. put on there. And because uh, I thought the melody was so powerful, even though it's so simple, it's deceptive. Mm. You play it, it ain't all as easy as it sounds. Yeah. <laughs> so, like, I'm just sticking with that just for a little bit. Um, so, the original song, A Cristo Redenta, would be, it wouldn't have been, it wasn't harmonica, obviously, was it? You, you transposed it, it into. Well, Donald Byrd played trumpet. Yeah, right, yeah. okay, so it's. But it didn't matter what the instrument was, the melody, mm. I always liked melody. Mm. Melody was like a statement, it's like saying something. Yeah. It's taking notes like taking words and making a sentence, you know, so it really appealed to me and that was a, such a strong melody. Oh, it's beautiful. I love it. I yeah. certainly do. I'm, when you were here last time, um, I mean, there were a lot, a lot of songs I loved listening to that, you know, you guys were playing, but at the end of the night when you would, you know, pretty much finish with that, um, it's just such a really nice way of rounding up a night of music, you know? It's actually in two keys. I mean, when I start out, let's say if I'm playing it in C with a B-flat harmonica, I start off playing in uh, fourth position in the key of G. Yeah. And then we go to C, which is third position on the B-flat. Right, so that brings me to <laughs> um, the positions in the harp, because I remember we did, uh, you know, an interview last time you were here in Australia, and you were asked about keys and things like that, and you went, well, I've just got, you know, the one harmonica here, and I can play it in, you know, I think it was four or five positions or something. Yeah. Maybe you could just show us a bit of that, because I, I no, absolutely would, to have you floored me. A Seidel harmonica here. Oh. That's the, the brand I play. This is the only, the last harmonica company in Germany. It's still made in Germany. They make them one at a time by wow. hand, you know. I mean, they have machines too, but they really put them together and tune them by hand. Yeah. It's the, the best. So this is a C harmonica. When the, the diatonic was originally thought of and designed, it was only thought of to be played in the key of C, which in C would be like, that's the C note, that's an octave up. A C. But then uh, blues guys started messing with it. <laughs> Probably uh, country guys too. I don't know the whole history of how people learn to pl start playing another keys. It'd be an interesting book or something. Yeah. So second position would be the key of G. If you follow the circle, circle of fifths, mm -hmm. it'd be like C, G, D, E, A like that. So uh, this is that's a G note. That's a G note. That's the key of G. And then D, those are D notes. So that's three. And A would be uh, the fourth position. <laughs> That's A on a C harp. Yeah. And then uh, E would be fifth position. Those are two E notes. <laughs> So that's, uh, that's five. Yeah. Well, so I know people that can play in 12 keys on one yeah. harmonica. That's all there are. Yeah. <laughs> wow, that's, I love that. That's, um, I mean, yeah, not a lot of people would know that, I don't think, you know, well, just the average. You know. Well, one way to use that is like, say you're in the key of G, 
and you put, you know, the one, four, five chord change, it'd be G, C, and D. So for the one chord, you play G, then the four chord, and then the five chord. So you got the, you just change the position for each chord change. Wow. That's, <laughs> that's very cool, very cool. Yeah. But, so, um, it gives you ways to think about it. Yeah. You? All the patterns each position offers you, you can use those patterns. So we're fun. There's more to it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the, um, <laughs> yeah, the, it's like, um, it's, it gives a whole lot of uh, different kinds of feeling, doesn't it, with the different positions, you know, where it could be a more of a, I don't know, a, a happy kind of, each one Same. has its own flavor, its yeah. own character. Yeah. yeah. Wow, that's really not like that. That's, um, so, you just you just won a Grammy with um, Ben, uh, Ben Harper, uh, which I think is a great album. I, Thank yeah, you. yeah. It's, um, and I remember watching you guys at uh, Blues Fest, and it was awesome. It was probably I reckon it was the best thing there that year for oh, sure. Oh boy, we had so much fun on stage. Yeah, it was a lot of fun, and uh, we have about half of an album in the can, as they say. And yeah. But it probably won't get finished and released for another year or something like that. So after that, it'll be more fun. Yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. That's cool. So how, how did you get to meet Ben? I mean, like, um, did he, he just, was he, um, I don't know, you met him for a mutual friend, I suppose, um, or how did that come about? Well, we met you way back uh, one time when Ben was opening for John and Hooker. And, uh, <laughs> and that's my favorite tune. <laughs> Sorry about that. And so, uh, okay. and I was playing with John Lee. John would often call me up if I wasn't doing something else and say, oh, no, come, 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 come on and down and help the old boy out. And that's why I'd go sit in with him and play. And so I happened to be there that night to been open for John Lee. Mm -hmm. Then not long after that, uh, uh, John Lee was doing an album called Friends, where each cut had a, somebody, some friend of his playing on it. Mm -hmm. And we did a tune called Burn in Hell. Mm -hmm. uh, and Ben and his group and I were backed up John Lee. And that was the first time we actually got in the studio together and worked together. And that's where we really locked in. We already knew we liked the same kinds of music, yeah. but we hadn't played together until we got in the studio. And uh, even John Lee at that session said that, you know, we should do more things together because we clicked together so well. And we kept talking about it for years. And our paths would cross here and there, even here in Australia. Mm. Uh, but we're both so busy, we just never had the time. Finally, we found the time. We were off at the same time, went in the studio, and just, man, the music just poured out. Just yeah. one tune after another. Like a, like wild horses trying to break out. <laughs> Each tune was anxious to get out and play. It. Yeah. And uh, it was a real casual and spontaneous session. In fact, on one of the tunes, you could hear me laughing and talking, because I didn't even know we were recording. <laughs> I thought we were just jamming or something. So you, you played with Ben you know, on, on this album, Get Up, which was, you know, what, you, you did like uh, an album with the, um, oh, the Cuban, also, I'm trying to think of the name. <laughs> Elias Ochoa, a Quarteto Patria. Yeah, how did that come about? Well, that's completely like, well, I was, I'm always, ever since I was a kid in Memphis, I was going around to junk stores looking for blues records. Old 78s and mm -hmm. stuff, they were like a nickel back then. And, uh, but anything else I saw that looked interesting, I'd buy that too. So I discovered a lot of music that seemed to have a feeling to it that reminded me of blues, mm -hmm. like uh, uh, Greek music and mm -hmm. Greek rumbetica music. Uh, Arab music, uh, all different kinds of stuff. And uh, so I discovered this Cuban traditional song, they call it. 
And I thought, man, that sounds great. Who are these, this quartet of Patria? Uh, and I, I knew a guy that could get all their CDs out of Cuba. And I had everything they recorded. Mm -hmm. I just couldn't get enough of their music. Uh, Eliana Sochoa, who's the head of that group, also played uh, in the Buena Vista Social Club. Yeah. He was the guy with the big white cowboy hat. Yeah. I call Eliana the Muddy Waters of Cuba. <laughs> He's really down home. Oh, yeah. But he lives in Santiago, not Havana. In Havana, those guys wear their ruffle shirts and their pants up to here. <laughs> <laughs> and they would rather you didn't know about the guys in Santiago because they're the real deal. Yeah. It's kind of like the difference between Chicago and Clarksdale, Mississippi. Uh, yeah. The real stuff comes from down there. Well, uh, I was in Norway in Bergen, playing at the Bergen Blues and Roots Festival. And uh, I was talking to the uh, one of the promoters or the organizers of the festival, and it just by coincidence came up that we both were huge fans of Quartetto Patria. Neither one of us had ever met anybody else that knew anything about them or was interested in their music like he and I were. Mm -hmm. So we were really happy to have this conversation and talk about, you got this one, you got that one, you like that tune, oh yeah. I mean, we were both into it. So I go home. About a month later, the guy calls up and says, hey, guess what? I got Quartetto Patria coming to my festival and I want you to come back so I could hear him. Mm -hmm. And that was awfully nice of him to do that to me. So uh, I got to thinking about it and I thought, man, maybe I should borrow some kind of one of those portable re recorders so in case I get to jam with them or something, it'd be nice to have that over a tape. Mm -hmm. And I thought, hmm. You know, they probably had a studio there in in Havana, and we could actually go go in the studio and record. And uh, Henrietta became the producer, and we got a uh, engineer to record us. And uh, Sam Lemer, we took him and bought a big duffel bag full of tape and took it to uh, back to uh, Bergen, Norway, and met Quartetto Padre there and went in the studio and. They were all for it, and we made a deal and and recorded. First, my idea was that they would play blues with the Latin beat, mm -hmm. and I played them some tapes, and I could just see them like <laughs> they did, they had never heard of any of that. They didn't know, had never heard of Muddy Waters, never heard of BB King, didn't know anything about blues. So I, I said, "That's okay. I've listened to so much of your music. You play what you play. I'll play with you. Won't be any no problem." Yeah. And so that's what we did. And then I changed, I took their traditional tunes and put blues lyrics to them. They're not not translations, but whole different yeah. words. Yeah, oh, cool. And that's what I did. Excellent. <laughs> um, I think uh, we're going to have to, yeah, go into the studio. I've got. <laughs> yeah, we're good to go. Yeah. Yeah. No, sorry, Charlie, guys, I'm, I'm lucky. No, all right. Nice <laughs> to meet you guys. How's it going? I'm Bruce. Bruce, nice and to meet you. Charlie. Charlie. <laughs> Lovely to meet you. Nice to meet you. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, if I could bring you guys through to uh, just to meet Rebecca, we've got a song going and we'll yeah. be good to go after that. Sure. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> we'll, we'll, yeah. we'll pick up later. We will. <laughs> we sure will. I ain't lying. <laughs> <laughs>